Have you ever wondered whether time management actually works? Whether it makes us happier and more productive at work? We asked ourselves the same questions, which is why we review the existing literature on time management. But we couldn't get a straight answer. Findings were very mixed and confusing. Sometimes time management improves our performance, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it improves our well-being, and sometimes it doesn't. But we noticed that there are many ideas out there in sociology, psychology, and behavioral economics that can help us make sense of this mess. So we integrated ideas from these different disciplines and came up with three novel perspectives that explain why time management may or may not work. The first perspective draws from sociological concepts, especially the notion of time norms. Time norms are basically unwritten expectations about what people should do with their time. For example, Imagine that you're working for a company that expects you to work long hours. In this company, being good at time management will get you nowhere because you'll probably finish your work in less time and managers will think you're not committed to your job, which will ultimately get you a bad performance review. So based on this new perspective, if we really want to know whether time management boosts performance, we have to take into account the invisible time norms of organizations. The second perspective draws on psychology especially individual differences related to time. Some people like to do things fast. Others like to take their time. Some people like to think about the future. Others prefer to enjoy the present. This means that because people have different conceptions of time, some people are more receptive to time management training than others. For example, research suggests that people who like to do one thing at a time will probably benefit more from time management seminars than people who multitask. So the bottom line of our second perspective is that because people are different, the way they approach time management is different, and we need to take into account those differences in order to understand whether, and for whom, time management works. The third perspective draws on behavioral economics, and particularly how people make decisions about time. When it comes to making decisions, people do just fine with money. They behave more or less rationally. But with time, people behave very differently, because time is invisible, intangible, finite, and therefore much harder to account for. For example, when people throw good money after bad, they fall prey to what is called a sunk cost effect. They become more and more committed to a course of action in which they have invested money. But the sunk cost effect does not seem to hold when it comes to time. However, when people undergo time management training, they can become more aware of the value of their time and the sunk cost effect reappears. This can become a problem because people can escalate commitment to an activity in which they have already invested significant amounts of time. And as research shows, escalation of commitment can be detrimental because people can become overcommitted to a course of action that ends up being unprofitable. The bottom line is, we need to pay more attention to how time management is taught and whether time management itself creates biases that are ultimately counterproductive. So what do these new perspectives mean, practically speaking? First, beyond focusing on employees' individual time management practices, it's important to focus on how organizational culture affects how employees manage their time. Research shows, for instance, that employees who work for companies that have time management friendly policies are less stressed out and less likely to quit. Second, time management programs should stop taking a one-size-fits-all approach. Research from psychology and behavioral economics show that time management training really needs to accommodate individual differences by tailoring its contents to people's specific needs. So where do we go from here in terms of future research? First, we need to acknowledge that time norms play a huge role in how we manage our time. That's why we need more qualitative approaches to time management research. Interviews and rich descriptions can reveal the invisible forces that affect the way that we manage time. Second, future research on time management should be mindful that we're not all the same. Pre-existing differences among participants can create selection bias. For example, People who make the time to participate in time management research might already be good enough at time management. And people that have time management issues might not have the time to participate in them, which biases your sample. Finally, we need more research that takes a very micro approach to time management, an approach that focuses on how people make simple decisions about time. Experiments show that people don't think about time the way they think about money or even other resources. But time is a critical resource that we need in our day-to-day -day life. So we really need more research to understand how people use, save, waste, steal, share, give, and manage time. So the bottom line of our review is that there is no one best way to manage time. The effectiveness of time management 
will depend on the fit between practices, individual differences, the surrounding environment, and the way time management is taught. And remember, life is short, so manage your time accordingly. Thank you.